Good evening. Thank you all for joining us this evening. My name is Margaret LaForest. I am the new Chief of Staff for Mayor Kokoris and Director of Operations for the Town of Braintree. I want to thank the Braintree Public Schools for hosting us this evening and BCAM for filming here this evening. We are not streaming live, but they are here recording. Also, we have some clipboards being passed around. We are asking for you to sign in uh, with your contact information in case we would like to uh, keep, keep you posted of matters moving forward. This evening, we're going to have a series of speakers and we'll follow with a panel discussion with opportunity for the public to have questions and answers. We have with us this evening, Mayor Kokoris, we have Senators Timulty and Representative Cusack. We have the team from Clean Harbors. We have our, our municipal team. We have the state agencies, Mass Department of Environmental Protection and Mass Department of Public Health. So a great subject matter experts to make sure you understand the information that they're disseminating and have a chance to answer any questions that you may have this evening. With that, I welcome to the podium our mayor, Tom, uh, Charles Kokoris. I don't have this. Thank you, Margaret, um, and welcome everybody tonight. I just want to uh, acknowledge my staff that's here, uh, Margaret LaForest, uh, Kate Naughton, Dan Hickey, uh, as well as those are the people you call if you ever need anything in my office. Um, we have uh, Lieutenant Ng from the Police Department. We have uh, Bob Pesfrino from the Fire Department, Chief O'Brien from the Fire Department, Russ Forsberg, our building inspector, Mary Beth McGrath, uh, who's in charge of licensing and inspections, and um, Chris Griffin from Recreation. And did I miss anybody on my staff? I don't think so. And as well, we have um, Councilor, Council President Berica, Councilor Hume, uh, Councilor Maglio, and Councilor Flaherty. And I don't think I missed anybody else. Did I? What did I miss? What is it? Oh, Councilor O'Brien, sir. Thank you for coming. Um, we, uh, it's probably been a little bit over 90 days and it was important for us to come together and, and have uh, a discussion and really go over where we are uh, since the fire that occurred uh, back in February. And there's been a lot of things happening. Um, I know we've had a couple of uh, meetings before the council and you know, as we've progressed, you know, f for, for me, it's, it's important uh, so that the, the demands that we've kind of put on Clean Harbors to make sure that um, we have a safe environment for our residents. Uh, some of those things um, you've probably heard about, uh, air quality monitors, um, fire suppression, um, as well as um, a number of other items that um, we've, we've been talking uh, to them about, things that we'd like to see happen. And the report um, from Tetra Tech uh, is out, and we know that there's some interesting uh, facts in there, uh, some things that we didn't know about, uh, some things that we did know about. So it was important, uh, really, first of all, to kind of give you an update as to what we've been doing uh, as far as meeting with um, different agencies and, and trying to come up with solutions uh, based on the postmortem of, of the situation and, and uh, what we need to do to prevent uh, situations like this from happening, uh, to uh, have DPH here, Department of Public Health, to talk about um, the fire, you know, what, what health issues um, may or may not um, have occurred from the fire, and, and to have an update on that. Um, DEP obviously uh, monitors and um, licenses um, Clean Harbors, so it's important for DEP to give an update as to where they're at and, and what um, they're looking at uh, from Clean Harbors, and also to have Clean Harbors here uh, to talk about um, some of the things that, that they're looking to do. Um, obviously, we, we certainly want to have uh, air quality monitoring. That is something that um, we will not uh, waver from as well. Um, the fire suppression, obviously this uh, occurred where there wasn't any fire suppression and I think before, you know, uh, future um, 
engagement in the activities uh, that were done previously in the storage of these trailers that were uh, full of um, product that was leaving and going um, were held there for approximately five days. Uh, it's important that um, you know we had requested uh, at minimal fire suppression and separation of the trailers. Um, the other thing we had talked about, another issue was electronic data, uh, knowing what's on site uh, so that if there was another incident ever, uh, we would have that information. And um, one of the things that was interesting is we were really struggling with how do we either get everyone to sign up um, for alerts or come up with some sort of alert system that would work. And we went to MEMA, and MEMA has a system in place that um, we discovered by having meetings with them. And that system will basically uh, allow us to take uh, an area, whether it's a five mile area or beyond, so, um, and notify everybody in that area, uh, any message that we want to send. So what it does is, unless it's shut off on your phone, which I don't even know where it is on my phone, so I, mine's not shut off, it gives you similar to an Amber Alert, and it, it notifies you with a message. And the, the downtime on it is anywhere from um, 15 uh, to 20 minutes. It might be a little longer. They just have to verify who's calling. But the system uh, is a solution to our communication piece that would allow us to uh, not only um, notify folks that live in the area, but notify folks that are um, coming into the area of what is going on. So it was a, it, it was a big piece that we really wanted to make sure uh, we got right. And uh, in addition to that, we have uh, worked with, we've had conversations with DPH, we had conversations with uh, DEP, we have co had conversations with Clean Harbors, and we continue to uh, stand strong for the residents our residents and make sure that um, all of these things are put in place before we support any uh, future activity uh, similar to what caused this fire. So I just wanted everyone to have the opportunity to not only hear from uh, the key stakeholders here, uh, but also our legislative delegation uh, because they've been actively involved as well and have uh, had many conversations as to how they could help. And, and lastly, um, have an opportunity for everyone to ask questions and uh, get facts and get the answers um, from all of the uh, parties involved. So with that, I just wanna thank everyone for coming and uh, I hope that everyone's uh, questions get answered and uh, we continue to move forward with making uh, the basin area um, safe and make sure that we have all of um, things in place necessary to protect you, our residents. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. We actually have our full state delegation, Representative Cusack, Senators Timothy, and Senator Keenan, who are each going to give some remarks this evening. Representative. Uh, good evening. I think the senators want to join. And thank you for having us. Um, we've been engaged in this since the fire. Um, I think we're on site within a few days with Congressman Lynch uh, and the local officials uh, and Clean Harbors DEP uh, and other uh, responders. Um, and since then, we've stayed up to date with the town, but also directly with our uh, state officials at DEP and DPH. Um, and unfortunately, you know, I'll say my 13 years after going through and still dealing with the Holbrook transfer station and the compressor station, it's disappointing, but it's also getting pretty ridiculous of how stacked it is against the residents versus a company. Um, and that's why I'm glad with my colleagues in the Senate uh, using the budget, which was our earliest in available uh, tool to try to get changes done. It was, get $100,000 included uh, for East Braintree, for environmental planning, for emergency planning. Uh, and the main thrust of that is the lack of an independent licensed site professional. 
and we can go round and round on the definition of independent, uh, but I'll use the basic English one of who's paying for it. They clean harbors pays for it. That's not independent. It doesn't build any trust and trust. Uh, sorry, with the community. Uh, so that hundred thousand dollars is going to be used hopefully to hire our own license site professional. Uh, and also with the emergency planning, as the mayor just mentioned about the uh, warning systems with MEMA or others, this money is available for that. Working with the public safety officials about how best to use this money, uh, which will be included in the final budget, uh, but also including language. Um, to direct fire suppression at every step of the loading and unloading of these chemicals at Clean Harbors. The idea that something is in transit for five days in a trailer doesn't fly. It's not in transit. It's being stored. There should be fire suppression in the trailers if it's going to sit there for five days. So uh, we're working legislatively on solutions. Um, and again, the budget was our quickest avenue. We have standing legislation ready to go that's a little longer. But there'll be many other vehicles uh, leaving the station to affect changes that, unfortunately, we aren't seeing the urgency or the proactiveness uh, from DEP. With that, I'll bring up the senators. Senator Timothy. Thank you. Representative Cusack, uh, thank you very much for your strong work on the budget. Uh, Mayor Kokoris, thank you very much for hosting us tonight and bringing us all together, and of course to your department heads and uh, each and every town employee, along with our colleagues on the council and uh, our chair of the school committee, Lisa Heger. Uh, we are all in this here together. Uh, we work for you folks, and we will never forget that. And of course, I'm here, of course, standing up here with Representative Cusack and Senator Keenan. We are all here to support our Braintree residents and, of course, our fellow citizens in the Four River Basin, many of whom have had your peace of mind stripped away following the clean fires hazardous materials conflagration on February 16th. The citizens who live both in Braintree and in the Four River Basin comprising Braintree, Weymouth and Quincy have been experiencing a fear of the unknown for the past four months. Furthermore, it is my belief that the Mass DEP must take all necessary steps to protect the health of our residents here in Braintree and in Quincy and Weymouth before any further permitting is authorized. Data must be provided that puts the events of February, 26, February 16, 2023 in lay terms, allowing for the public to fully understand what has happened, what is going on, what remediation is forthcoming, and what is quite simply to happen next. Additionally, all of the citizens here in the town of Braintree have been clear. Our citizenry here in this town, which we're all proud to represent and work for, have both strenuously and rightly expressed your valid fears and apprehension with clean harbors resuming operations as permitted by Mass DEP without this agency first creating more safeguards, and I do mean DEP creating more safeguards, to protect the residents of Braintree and our entire Four River Basin. I personally am extremely disappointed with Mass DEP's decision to authorize clean harbors at Braintree to resume operations, whether limited operation. Thank you. Whether limited operation or full operation. To that end, I have expressed my extreme disappointment in a, in a letter on April 24th directly to the Commissioner of DEP. Moreover, our Braintree residents want reassurance that they can conduct, conduct their daily lives without concern for their well being. And that goes for every citizen of the Four River Basin. As of yet, our friends and constituents, both here in Braintree and in the Four River Basin as a whole, do not have such reassurance. It is DEP's job to make sure that they are provided with such reassurance. Representative Cusack, Senator Keenan, and I, your mayor and your town councilors, are determined to see that through. I, too, share the grave concerns of each and every constituent of ours and our fellow citizens in the Four River Basin. I do not support Clean Harbor's resumption of operations until the public health report has been issued and people are fully satisfied and people's minds and mental well-being and peace of mind are laid to rest. Clean harbors should not receive authorization from Mass DEP unless and until all the questions and concerns of both the residents of Braintree and the Four River Basin and Braintree officials, who we are proud to work with, have been satisfactorily addressed in full. And with that, I thank each and every one of you for being here tonight. Again, Mayor, thank you. And thank you to my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Good evening. It's great to see everybody. 
I just wanted to give you, a, a, adding on to the comments from Representative Cusack and Senator Timulty, just a quick sense of what we've been doing. We have been reaching out to MEMA, to Department of Public Health, and to DP, uh, DEP to continue to get updates on what it is that they're doing. Um, we met with them in person on April 26th, and at that meeting they conveyed to us where they were in terms of data gathering, where they were in terms of reporting. And at that point they had assured us that there were no significant health hazards found. But at the same time, they conveyed that the data they had was not complete. And so what we asked is that they continue gathering that data, that they do that analysis, and until that was done, as the gentleman has said, that they not allow activities at Clean Harbors to resume. In particular, we asked them to wait until the health consult letter was completed before they even contemplated allowing any further resumption of activity uh, down at Clean Harbors. And the health consult letter will reveal the results of their testing to date. It will reveal what their modeling has shown and whether that modeling indicates that additional study is needed or that an additional work is needed. So from our perspective, to allow the resumption of any activity down there without that being done would just be irresponsible. So we followed up our meeting with them with a rather short and direct communication, again asking that they not allow the resumption of any additional work at Clean Harbors, any activities down there until that health consult letter was completed, that it was released to the mayor, to, to the town officials, that it was released to us and to the public, and that we all had an opportunity to review that, to assess it, and to communicate and work with them in determining whether additional work was needed. Again, to resume any additional activity down there without that process being complete, we believe to be irresponsible. And uh, we are willing to work with everybody to make sure that we have what we need, to make sure that the public is assured that it is safe and that any issue related to the fire has been fully addressed. So that's the work that we will continue to do, and we look forward to working with the mayor and the town officials uh, to make sure that that work is done. And uh, we're hopeful that we will soon re receive that information, uh, that we'll have that opportunity to review it, assess, and then determine next steps. Um, so I want to thank you all for coming out this evening. I want to thank the mayor and the town councilors for the work that they have been doing on this, for the public's engagement in this. And if we continue to stick together and work together, we're confident that we will get uh, to the point where if there's something else that needs to be done, it will be done. And we will hold people's feet to the fire to make sure that it is done. Thank you. Thank you so much to our state delegation. They've been true partners to Mayor Kokoris and the administration uh, in, in having such work um, channels with the state agencies that we're bringing before you this evening. At this time, I'd like to welcome the President and Executive Vice President of Facilities, Becky Underwood, um, from Clean Harbors. Thank you, Margaret. Mr. Mayor, Town Councilors, state representatives and regulators. My name is Becky Underwood. I'm the president and EVP of facilities for Clean Harbors. I'm joined tonight by my SVP of facilities, Mike Foley, and Tom Nuno, the independent licensed site professional from Tetra Tech. Clean Harbors appreciates the opportunity to collaborate with the town of Braintree on a strategy that supports our continued operation in a safe and sustainable manner. We understand that the fire earlier this year has raised a lot of questions and concerns. It's always been our goal to work collaboratively with the mayor and the Braintree community to address these issues. Our team has always tried to be a good neighbor and support the public safety, health, and environmental issues in our host communities where we operate and live. And our conversations, and more importantly, our actions, 
will continue in that spirit. As you know, our services are vital to the residents, the community, all the hospitals, schools, power companies, retail stores, gas stations, and other industrial companies in Braintree, the Four River Basin, and across New England. Without us, our residents and the rest of these generators have no safe disposal out outlet for their waste. Our number one job is to use our people and technology to safely handle and dispose of hazardous waste to protect the health and environment of our residents. And that is exactly what we will do and continue to do. Since the incident, we have returned to partial, op partial operations with no incidents. We've also had on site with us to witness how we've been operating fire detail since that situation. With that at top of mind, while our operations are regulated by the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection, and they are the organization charged with formally reviewing the incident and working with us on a go forward action plan to return to full operations, we and they recognize the need to continue addressing your concerns and all, continue, all of us continue working together to advance the safety and public health and environment of Braintree. Over the past several months, we have been focusing on listening, collecting your concerns, working with experts to more deeply investigate the incident, and identify additional safeguards above and beyond our permits in order to address the concerns of the residents and the town. We've had take, we take this very seriously, and in addition to the requirements from the DEP, we are willing to commit to a series of steps that reinforce safety at the facility and support the broader public safety goals. We have identified six key priorities based on conversations with the town officials and feedback from the residents uh, from past town halls. Some of these include, first, updating the facility to add additional fire hydrant for ease of firefighter accessibility and redundancy. This will be taken off the Hill Avenue um, spur as it uh, gets updated um, in the coming months. Incorporate a new fire suppression system that is currently in the process of being designed for the facility. We have purchased and are using portable fire suppression systems until any of the updates are complete. This includes the already comprehensive fire system that is in place and in use for partial operations. We're adding visible signage markings to the various areas of the plant for increased ease of material identification. These updates are happening in tandem with the changes Clean Harbors is making as a part of our remediation plan and with the Massachusetts DEP. We're conducting and, and agreeing to conduct what we call specialized training for 24 hour hazardous operations for all Braintree uh, first responders. This includes both hazardous materials response and a safety drill that we will organize and facilitate. These activities build on our longstanding support and collaborative partnership with the fire department. Given the number of other facilities in Braintree that have hazardous materials on site, this is an important training benefit that will help the town with overall risk management and first responders can apply these learnings gained to these facilities as well. Supporting evacuation planning. We continue and are in efforts to collaborate with the town and its public safety officials. We're helping to bring our resources and relationships with experts like the Emergency Management Center at Mass Maritime to help coordinate with the and collaborate with the town. We're advancing air monitoring goals by contributing to a comprehensive air monitoring program for residents of the basin. We're hosting a household hazardous waste day in September that will be free to Braintree residents to deal with and, and take in all of their hazardous waste. We particularly appreciate the opportunity to reinforce how valuable our services are, not just to businesses, 
in the town as well as institutions, but for every single resident of Braintree. We're also reimbursing the response costs for the fire department, recognizing that this was anticipated expense for the town, as well as we'll pay for um, uh, various costs that the town has previously requested. We thank the town and the residents for their transparency and collaboration. It's been helpful and productive to have transparent conversations with the mayor and his team about their needs, and we appreciate the opportunity to find a reasonable path forward. As we continue to work with the DEP to finalize the path to return to truck-to-truck -to -truck operations, we remain committed to addressing the community's concerns, not just with words, but with actions, as I just described, to keep improving and creating a better environment for everyone in Braintree and the surrounding communities. Now I would like to turn it over to our licensed site professional, Tom Nuno from Tetra Tech to discuss the findings of the IRAC report. As we, as we bring Tom to the stage, I just want to, um, the Clean Harvest was required to complete through their licensed site professional an immediate response action report. So who aside from the mayor's team has nerded out on the data in the IRAC report? Anybody in the audience? Okay, myself and Councillor Maglio and the uh, mayor in our, in our team. And I just wanted to share as part of the public process on this, tonight's comments are going to be pretty high level. We are going to get into Q&A and we'll welcome you to address that. The data is very scientific. And so a meeting is being scheduled for next Monday, June 12th at 7 p.m. at the Abigail Adams Middle School. So if there are any data science nerds who really are um, looking for next level, just keep, um, I just wanted to keep the, you know, the understanding as to what's transpiring here. It's very scientific and, and difficult. And so we've asked Tom to disseminate it to Senator Timothy's terms and, you know, in lay person speak, right? So bring the crayons, help us understand the hundreds of pages of uh, data that's been analyzed. So thank you, Tom. Sure, thanks. Thank you for inviting me. <clears throat> uh, just as a background, I've, I've been an environmental or a, site, a licensed site professional for close to 30 years since the beginning of the program. This program was actually developed by public advocacy groups to um, speed up the cleanup process at our sites in Massachusetts. Um, back in the early 90s, that uh, process was bogged down by huge volumes of work that DEP could not keep up with. And, uh, and the program uh, came to be where they licensed uh, site professionals as, as I am today. So, uh, and I've been licensed since pretty much the beginning of that program. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the fire response here. And uh, as Ms. LaForce mentioned, um, if you need, if you desire additional detail on exactly how we calculated things, um, that will be provided in the meeting on Monday, uh, June the 12th, okay? Um, I guess I'll have to write. There we go. So uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is the, the, the event of the fire itself, the response actions that we implemented, and the future uh, activities that will uh, take place. So, uh, wow. OK, and I apologize. I kind of expected that this screen would be much larger, and I realize that none of you can, not even if you put your glasses on, sir, uh, can probably read this. So I'll just, I'll just essentially read the bullets to you. So shortly before 9 p.m., nine trailers staged at the loading dock on the western portion of the Clean Harbor site were involved in a fire. The fire was extinguished within three hours due to the very uh, efficient efforts of the Braintree Fire Department. 
The cause of the fire was attributed to auto ignition of improperly characterized waste by a, the customer in one trailer that spread to two other trailers. Um, so really there were only three trailers that were intensely involved in the fire. Um, approximately 51 tons of material was involved. Uh, this included truck bodies and tires. And that, that includes all nine trailers. Um, and uh, subtracting the materials that were recovered, and, and it, it, indeed, although many of the drums and things inside some of the trucks were not touched, the trucks themselves uh, melted, the tires burned, things like that. So subtracting the, the drums of materials that were recovered whole, um, the overall estimated quantity was about 18,786 pounds. Um, and it's a good amount. A lot of that was truck tires, uh, or some of it certainly. Uh, and then approximately 330 gallons of firefighting water was applied to the trailers. The capture efficiency of the firefighting water is estimated to be nearly 100%, and there's uh, uh, some variations on that, uh, due to the presence of greater than 99.5% impervious, uh, impervious paved surfaces at the facility. Sorry. So, uh, in evaluating potential impacts to air and residential soil, we looked at emissions to air, which were measured uh, during and following the fire via, via handheld um, monitoring equipment and monitoring stations. Uh, there was monitoring during the fire of critical indicator parameters such as total VOCs and carbon monoxide. I know I've heard some, critical, some criticisms of the use of four gas meters which measure carbon monoxide, but it is actually a really good indicator of the uh, potential health impacts from the fire because if there's not much carbon monoxide, that indicates that the fire is burning very hot and, and the, uh, the combustion efficiency is very high. Therefore, um, the products of incomplete combustion are, are very low. Uh, then uh, a week after the fire, uh, I, uh, so anyway, in addition, uh, so these monitoring activities were carried out by clean harbors around the perimeter of the site, Mass DEP and the Braintree Fire Department at, at the plant perimeter and in the neighborhoods. Then there was post-fire monitoring, which my company conducted a week later um, to monitor uh, VOCs and particulate matter at the plant perimeter. And then finally, uh, air and deposition modeling, as you know, was conducted by GHD uh, to uh, assess particulate matter emissions that would have taken place potentially during the fire uh, and also determine potential depositions to properties around uh, the, the proximity of the fire. So response actions that were implemented to mitigate discharges to pavement and soil include, obviously, the firefighting water was pumped to 15, was captured and pumped to 15 uh, to 22,000 gallon frack tanks. Uh, this, this capture efficiency on firefighting water is extraordinary. Uh, just so you understand, most fires, there is no capture of the firefighting water. Um, as much as I hate to say it, the fire departments are our worst enemy, uh, you know, from an environmental standpoint, because they put a lot of water on fire, and we, the environmental people, usually have to chase it. Uh, so in this case, the high capture efficiency at this facility was uh, enormously uh, beneficial. Um, then there's the impacted soil areas. There, because of the high impervious nature of the site, there are only three areas of impervious soil at the site. One was near the actual fire, and two others were out on the perimeter of this uh, area where the water was captured. And one of the reasons why the water is captured is that uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but uh, there's, there's concrete walls around the uh, low portions of the facility. 
And then along this portion of the facility, there's uh, sand berms, which were there to potentially capture fire. Um, so the, there was a little bit of soil near the loading dock area and a little bit of soil in front of the employee lunchroom area and then uh, the berm area soils were impacted by the, the firefighting water. And we could see the impacts because the firefighting water um, carried with it a soot which was visually noticeable. So you could see where there was black soot impacts and this was uh, the areas that we targeted for cleanup and so forth. So all this, uh, so we remediated those soil areas via repaving over the uh, truck loading dock area and via vector excavation in the pr other perimeter areas. All solids from the fire, including soil, sorbent materials, drums, paving, trailer bodies, and tires, have been removed and disposed of as hazardous waste. So out of an abundance of caution, we called all this stuff a hazardous waste and disposed of it in hazardous waste facilities. As a precautionary measure, we also pumped back 30,000 gallons of surface water uh, that had migrated to the Sitgo Pond, which is immediately adjacent to the site. Uh, and also a sorbent boom was placed in the Four River at the Hayward Brook discharge uh, due to some observations there on the, um, on the uh, river, which uh, the source of which really couldn't be uh, confirmed. So uh, again, evaluating potential impacts to air and water. We have the monitoring the, during the fire. This showed that localized concentrations of CO were, were essentially zero in every case and VOCs during the fire event were very low, similar to what we typically measure around the neighborhood, um, but uh, very, very low concentrations. Uh, in all cases, less than, less than one part per million, and uh, most of the readings were less than, say, 0.4, I believe, parts per million, uh, and the cl those closest of those being on the actual perimeter of the, of the, uh, of the the facility itself. Then uh, particular emissions in air and deposition modeling. Uh, this is uh, where we, we use worst case scenario modeling of particulate matter and compared this with nearby air monitoring stations uh, and found that the nearby air monitoring stations validated our modeling efforts in that our model predicted higher concentrations than the nearby air monitoring stations, which is to be to be expected because we're modeling the worst part of the plume. So we took the worst part of this plume that we modeled, okay, and there, there, there was a, an area of, of the highest concentration, and then we assumed a deposition rate of that worst part of the plume onto a, 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 a fictitious piece of property, and then we calculated for the worst possible contaminants, which are dioxin and furans, which are essentially products of incomplete combustion of chlorinated solvents. And we calculated what the concentration would have been based on all sorts of worst case scenarios. Um, and using all these worst case assumptions, our estimated um, concentration of dioxin and furans, which are by far, like far and away, the most toxic thing that that exists at these fires uh, was less than one half of one thousandth of the Massachusetts criteria for residential soil, uh, which is, you know, uh, somewhat reassuring, I, I hope. So, a general assessment of the impacts. The fire was very short in duration, uh, three hours. It's very high temperatures, created ideal circumstances, which provided complete very more, more complete combustion and more vertical plume movement, uh, thereby limiting uh, local impacts. Um, the firefighting water was captured. The, the capture efficiencies I mentioned was exceptional. Um, 
The soil impacts were limited, very limited due to the impervious nature of the site and, and the fact that we were able to uh, vector excavate much of the contamination. And the groundwater impacts were virtually non-existent due to the limited time that, for water penetration into the soil. We found that water from the fire migrated no more than uh, 12 to 18 inches uh, in, in, the, in the worst place of the fire, which is right uh, beneath the trucks. And then uh, potential off-site impacts were shown to be well below significant risk for, m for the most toxic site contaminants as modeled in air. So conclusions and future actions uh, are that no imminent hazard conditions were found to exist at the site. This is a special uh, circumstance of uh, risk that we evaluate at these sites, and I will be going into that on Monday if somebody's very interested in that. The conditions that gave rise to the immediate response action activities were resolved within the 60-day time frame. Um, there were some, uh, there was some additional uh, wastewater that needed to be removed from the site because, as you can imagine, we had uh, 300. And 30,000 or 300,000 gallons of wastewater to be removed, and that just takes a long time. We were shipping it by truck via 500 or 5,000 gallon trucks. Um, so additional additional assessment activities are currently ongoing uh, at the Sitco property, and the site will continue to operate under the existing RECRA program. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, and then at this time, we'd like to welcome the Mass Department of Environmental Protection. They have quite the team with us, but for presentation, I believe it is going to be um, Southeast Regional Director, Millie Garcia Serrano. And if, any, if, if you want to please come forward, any of the other DEP for remarks. Thank you. Good evening. Um, Honorable Mayor Kokoros, uh, Town Councilors Maglio, Hugh O'Brien Flaherty, Senator Keegan, excuse me, Senator Keenan, Senator Timothy, and Representative Cusack. It's really an honor for me to be here standing in front of you tonight representing the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. I serve as a regional director in the Southeast region. We're located in Lakeville. And we really appreciate being able to sit, to be here tonight to talk a little bit more about our findings and observations as well as um, basically just provide you with an overview of the work that we've been doing since MassDP was engaged on this very important matter, the night of the fire. First, just by way of context, I'm wondering, is anyone here who has not attended prior meetings, just so I can kind of get a sense for uh, new audiences? Thank you so much. We really, truly appreciate the engagement, and we look forward to working with you and continuing to coordinate and communicate with you. Thank you so much. So as I stated first, um, we appreciate the opportunity to come back to your community and provide everyone with an update regarding Mass DEP's activities in connection with the Clean Harbors fire incident. Since February 16, our agency has made it a top priority to remain accessible and responsive to municipal officials, legislators and residents of Braintree and all of its surrounding communities. We continue to stay engaged by reviewing and sharing information, and as we receive it, we post it on our website, a web page that was created just for this very important incident so that there's knowledge and availability of information at your fingertips. Our involvement crosses over many Mass DEP programs with Chapter 21E and its governing regulation, which is titled Massachusetts Contingency Plan. The MCP is the cleanup program that basically mirrors the larger federal Superfund program. Also, um, as LSP Nuno explained, he used the acronym and then he explained it a little bit, RECRA, which is the Resource Conservation 
and Restoration Act. And those are the two priority programs that we will be focusing on. There are many other programs, for example, that touched this particular incident, but again, today we'll be focusing on the MCP and RECRA. In addition, MassDP has been coordinating with our colleagues at MassDPH, the Department of Public Health, so we are now working together as a team to be responsive to your request that we continue in evaluating the site with a very special focus on health. So tonight I will provide you with a very brief overview of the 21E related actions and all of the work that we've been doing out of the Southeast region. Also, my colleague Greg Cooper, who is the director of the Solid Waste and Hazardous Waste Program in Boston, he's going to be following up my, my few remarks as it pertains more to the facility and its permitting status. So for those that were not at prior meetings, maybe you've heard this a little bit before, but I'm just going to recap very quickly various of the facts as we know it based on our involvement since the night of the fire. So MassDP received a page from the Mass Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency, MEMA, at 10.39 p.m. on the night of the fire, February 16th, and at 11.45 p.m., our emergency responder arrived on site. He was actually joined by other state and local officials, as well as federal officials from the U.S. Coast Guard, the HAZMAT team, they all were joining in with the fire chief to assess the situation. Mass DEP's emergency responder pulled off the side of the, of the road and actually started turning on all of the air monitoring equipment that is available to us, which basically for this particular situation, as uh, Mr. Nuno explained, um, consisted of two handheld air monitoring devices. One of them is a multi-gas meter, and that monitors oxygen, carbon monoxide, hydrogen sulfide, and methane. The second device is what is called a PID, which is a photoionization detector, and that measures total volatile organics. Several readings were taken as close as 50 feet off the fire. MassDP now maintains an air quality monitoring station in North Weymouth. That particular station recorded elevated particulate matter during the hours at this particular event. And the atmospheric particulate matter was also present in and around the facility during the fire incident. Clean Harbors then deployed particulate monitors in and around the perimeter of the site in the days that followed. By then, the fire had already been extinguished and these monitors did not identify any remarkable atmospheric concentrations that led to any hazard, especially for the team that was responding. Um, I'd like to basically note that we do have that web page, and I really encourage you to take a look at it. More than happy to share that web page. It has all sorts of information, including the real data and all of the information that we have on this site as of today. So the night of the fire, MassDP was informed that the Clean Harvest Facility had been designed to capture and hold the firefighting runoff water, and the topography of the property actually slopes towards the banks of the river, which is near the rear of the property. Therefore, there was some pooling that was observed there. Tonight, and as we reviewed that report, and tonight was affirmed, there was some additional significant water that was actually captured. So at this time, we understand there's a second licensed site professional who's working for CITGO, and they're currently collaborating to ensure that any potential water is clean, assessed and cleaned up during this particular process that we will be describing very shortly. So on the night of the fire, what MassDEP needs to do oftentimes, whether it's federal responders, state responders, is basically to facilitate the actual immediate response actions that need to take place immediately. There were several immediate response actions, we call them IRA activities, that were um, approved that night of the fire, including the product recovery, containment of the firefighting water, containment of the contaminated debris, excavation of any potential impacted soil, in addition to also cleaning the surfaces that had come in contact with the contaminated media and commence the assessment of any kind of work that needs to be had in order to start populating a report that will further develop the conceptual site model as to 
how contaminated is it, and how clean needs to be cleaned. So MassDEP's responder gave the licensed act professional that evening, the fire, gave them 60 days to put together a report. That report, titled IRA Completion Report, was due on April 17, 2023. That document was uploaded into our electronic EDP portal on that day. In addition to evaluating the Clean Harbor releases, the document also spoke about a release that also took place at the Sitco facility the night, pardon me, the day before the fire, and Sitco is the abutting location next to the Clean Harbor. So that actual release took place, and that was defined and identified in the report. So because Property owners that have a sudden release of oil hazardous materials on their property are required by MassDEP under our law to basically retain the services of a licensed site professional. A person who's licensed in the Commonwealth, they take a test, they give opinions subject to pains and perjury. Each of these facilities do have their very own licensed site professionals. As requested by town officials, MassDEP went ahead and reviewed and audited this report. So we want to thank you, uh, acknowledge that that was an incoming request to us, and we honored that request. And therefore, two different MassDEP auditors reviewed the report in accordance with the performance standards of our regulations and determined that the report was submitted on time, in addition to also meeting all of the performance standards and we would be more than happy to walk anyone through what our auditing program is and what kinds of things we look for to ensure that the document is not deficient. And if it were deficient, MassDEP would move forward with providing a notice of deficiency, audit finding, and potential deficiency if there is any deficiency to be had. I also wanted to note, as the licensed site professional stated, that way before this fire, and since the 1980s, the Clean Harbors property has been undergoing a special federal uh, cleanup program, basically participating in a corrective action program. And that program is actually designed for facilities like Clean Harbors. So just to sum it up, um, this process actually is compatible with our state regulations. Therefore, we coordinate and we make sure that we are not setting either program to fail. Very importantly, in April 2023, citizens from North Weymouth and Braintree filed a 10-person petition requesting that the Clean Harbor site become a public involvement participation site. In addition, also, we later received another petition for the Sitco facility to also become a public involvement plan site. So MassDEP, happily will participate in these meetings. Um, I think the important piece with that um, petition, and we want to say thank you to the petitioners, is that this process will afford a little bit more focus as it pertains to assessment and cleanup. MassDEP also wants to provide the town with the opportunity to participate in a technical assistance grant program should they desire to have their own licensed site professional to peer review this work. So with that, I look forward to participating in both the Clean Harbors and the CITGO public involvement meetings that are coming up. And I just want to thank everybody who's really given us a lot of very important, insightful perspective so that we can continue to understand this site. With that, I'd like to um, introduce my colleague, Greg Cooper, from the Boston office at DEP. Thank you. Thank you, Millie, and uh, thanks for all that information. Um, hi, I'm Greg Cooper. Um, I'm the director of Hazardous and Solid Waste out of Boston, and my office is responsible for licensing uh, these facilities and monitoring and keeping the hazardous waste regulations in Massachusetts up to date with federal requirements. Um, I thought it would just be helpful quickly. I know tonight's big focus is really kind of on the cleanup, what happened, you know, what, what's the conditions there, what, have we, what has been found. But I thought I wanted to just quickly address 
uh, some of the stuff relative to the operations of the facility itself. Um, I think Clean Harbor's kind of explained, you know, the work that they do. They collect uh, hazardous materials from businesses throughout Massachusetts uh, and manage those properly and dispose of them properly, uh, send them off for disposal, for uh, proper disposal. Um, and it's kind of a critical component, obviously, in the management of hazardous waste, having a uh, service that's convenient, accessible, uh, and does not result in uh, influencing you know, those types of companies to do something different with those hazardous wastes, uh, which is obviously more very detrimental to the environment when there's illegal dumping activities or something of that nature. So, in accordance with, you know, just we'll start with the uh, February 17th. Um, subsequent to the fire, uh, in, in accordance with Clean Harbor's contingency plan and also Mass DEP hazardous waste regulations, Clean Harbor ceased operations subsequently to the incident that took place in the fire. So at that point in time, they stopped full operations at the, at the facility. Um, on February 26th, uh, Mass DEP authorized Clean Harbors to initiate uh, restricted operations for the management and removal of the impacted materials. So all of the materials that Tom had spoken about that were generated needed to be collected and needed to have activities going on there to collect those materials. Um, I will say that each of these steps that I'm, these dates and times of approvals, the, the approvals are on our website uh, at the, uh, you know, the Mass DEP uh, Clean Harbors website. So you can read those letters and see what they entail. Um, and each, at each of those increments, we had inspectors on site uh, initially to ensure that there was, uh, you know, that the facility was in compliance at the time that the activity was being authorized. On March 9th, um, Mass, Mass DEP authorized Clean Harbors to reactivate their stormwater treatment and discharge operation. And that was in order to, uh, at that point in time, all of the firefighting water had been collected um, and what had accumulated at the, but the stormwater system, which was off since February, the night of February 6th, 7th, 16th, when the fire started, uh, until March 9th, had accumulated rain and snow melt, um, which needed to be moved uh, and, and treated and allowed to be. So that was the initiation of the startup of the stormwater treatment and discharge operation was to uh, remove that material from the site. Um, uh, once again, our, our inspectors were on site to make sure that that stormwater system had been recharged uh, and reassessed and was in proper working order before uh, commencing operations. Um, on March 15th, uh, Mass DEP, um, uh, after confirming uh, the in, you know, compliance status of Clean Harbors with its license and its solid waste regulations, uh, Mass DEP solid waste regulations, we authorized Clean Harbors to resume uh, partial operations uh, of the facility. Uh, and the operations that we were uh, allowing for uh, to reinstate were the bulk loading and the drum management activities. Um, the, the, we did not provide any authorization relative to the truck to truck. And, and if you're familiar with the operation, they're basically separate building activities. Um, and so the impacted areas of the, of the truck to truck uh, were not uh, impacting the activities at the bulk loading and drum storage area, drum management activities that were occurring. Um, that is a, you know, that was a, a you know, we, we had to recognize that there's a lot of operations that are relying on these types of facilities, including our own emergency response. We've got a truck rollover on a, on a highway, and we have to have uh, an expert such as Clean Harbors come and, and remove all that material and then manage it properly. Uh, so we had to kind of, and, you know, acknowledge that, that that operation, since it was not related to the truck to truck op, uh, facilities, which is where the fire took place, uh, it was prudent to allow that activity to, to start up. Uh, at this point in time, the truck-to-truck -truck operations are, are not, are, they are not, that truck-to-truck -truck operation is not moving forward. Um, we are working with uh, Clean Harbors and we're working with the city and the fire department um, 
to discuss, you know, how does recommencement take place, what time it takes place, what are some of the conditions that are placed in, in that. Um, at this point in time, Clean Harbors is in full compliance with our operating license and our hazardous waste regulations. So at this point, we're talking about additional measures that will, you know, address many of the concerns that the town and the residents and the fire department has uh, regarding fire protection and air monitoring elements. Um, we hope that we will be able to, you know, reach, uh, you know, a consensus on what those elements are uh, in order to allow the recommencement of the truck to truck operations there at the facility. Um, and it's really only a kind of, it will be a restricted, at this point in time, it would be a restricted recommencement of those activities. And that's because, uh, which would include a number of elements which would reduce the throughput and improve the safety measures, increased fire suppression, um, increased air monitoring, uh, increased safety measures. Um, and that's done, being done on a limited, uh, you know, a restricted basis, would be done on a restricted basis on this point. While Clean Harbors designs a more comprehensive uh, system that takes time for them, as you said, as they stated, they're, they're designing that type of activity as we speak, but it takes time to design, you know, permit, acquire, install, and have readily operable. So um, we're looking forward to and having and participating in the discussions about those elements also. Um, and we are hoping that we can come to a, you know, a conclusion where we can have a satisfactory resumption of activities there. And that's about all I have to say right now. Thank you. Thank you. The next agency we're going to bring forward is the Department of Public Health. With us this evening is Rachel Gladstone, Environmental Analyst with the Environmental Toxicology Program. Rachel. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for that introduction. And um, like Margaret said, my name is Rachel Gladstone. I'm an environmental analyst with the Environmental Toxicology Program at the Bureau of Environmental Health in the Department of Public Health for Massachusetts. Um, and we are here today at the request of the town of Braintree um, to address concerns about public health risks of exposure to contaminants released during the fire at the Clean Harbors facility on the night of February 16th. So by way of background, uh, DPH routinely works with federal, state, and municipal officials to understand the presence and nature of the health hazards in Massachusetts communities under a cooperative agreement with the H U.S. Agency for Toxic Disease and um, Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, which is also known as ATSDR. Um, and since February, um, we've been in court coordination with MassDP, the Braintree Town Council, the Mayor's Office, and the Health Department to support the town and residents in understanding health concerns related to the fire. So in response to this request, we've been evaluating environmental data and preparing a consultation document, otherwise known as a letter health consultation, um, to address community concerns related to this fire. Health consultations are designed to address community concerns and evaluate the potential for human health risk related to a specific source of contamination. So it could be a site, it could be a chemical release, or a known presence of a hazardous material. We, when we conduct a health consultation, we look for potential routes of exposure. So we look at things such as breathing, eating, or touching hazardous chemicals, and we consider both the amount of a chemical that someone is exposed to and the duration of time that someone could be exposed to that hazardous material. Because people um, can be harmed if they come in contact with a chemical for a sufficient amount of time and at a sufficient level that's capable of causing uh, a harmful level of exposure. So to assess the potential for harm, we compare potential exposure to health-based screening values established by regulatory agencies. 
Screening values are set at conservative health-based um, protection levels to protect all members of the public. So this includes people like children, older adults, or people with underlying health issues. Our assessment will examine the level of chemicals that have been released during the fire um, at the Clean Harbors facility and the potential for residents to experience both short-term and long-term health effects. Because of this, our work is gonna primarily focus on breathing as the um, primary route of exposure uh, to chemicals released during the fire. And we also refer this to as an inhalation exposure. In addition to data that's described in the report by the licensed site professional, we're reviewing data from the Massachusetts Air Monitoring Station that's located in Weymouth and eight purple air sensors in the Four River Basin, which is in the vicinity of the Clean Harbors facility. We'll use this information to analyze the level of particles that's in the air, as well as chemicals like nitrogen dioxide, ozone, and volatile organic compounds uh, that were measured during the fire and in the days after the fire was extinguished. So to, to assess the potential for health risks, we're comparing these measured concentrations to screening values established by federal agencies like ATSDR and the EPA, as well as those used by the World Health Organization and state regulatory agencies like MassDEP. Using these values, we're able to estimate the likelihood for individuals to experience harmful health effects from exposure to fire-related contamination. And our goal is to issue this, uh, this letter health consultation to the town of Braintree by the end of this month. The letter health consultation will be available to the public um, and it will be posted on the Massachusetts Department of Public Health website. So while this is underway, we also encourage anyone who has questions about their personal exposure um, or any questions that they have related to the fire to feel free to contact the Environmental Toxicology Program. Um, if you have your pens ready, it's 617-624-5757. Um, and we treat any calls that we have in a confidential manner, so no personally identifying information will be shared um, or included in our report. Um, so that's all I have. Thank you, everybody. Okay, that is all of our presentations this evening, and if our speakers and the various representatives uh, could come forward, we'll get set up for our panel discussion. What we're going to do for audience questions is have you come down the aisle, either, either aisle that you're at, um, to be able to ask those questions. Because we do have B-CAM filming, uh, this, these mics are not connected to B-CAM, so I'll be repeating the question and kind of directing uh, who our respondents are going to be. I know we have quite a few from DEP, from Clean Harbors, from DPH, and our LSP. Just a matter of housekeeping for the panel. The middle microphone is the B-CAM microphone. And just we ask those who are going to come forward with their questions to please state your name and address for the record, for the public record. Okay, thank you. We'll start with your question, sir. Yeah, I'm Dave Ricca, and my address is 49 Sterling Street, Braintree. And you mentioned there's a website that we go to. I don't get the information. Does that have um, a, a, a location in you know, times of the objects? In different times, I understand the need to mention those now also. So, so just to, re to repeat the question for BCAM at home, the question was the website that was referenced by MassDEP. How, how do we get that directed to that? 
Good evening. Thank you for the question. So I'm going to actually have Mr. John Hanrahan, um, who is the Deputy Regional Director for the Cleanup Program at DEP. We'll have a review of that website. Um, I'm going to give you a screenshot tonight. That way you can navigate it. Mm -hmm. And it will have all sorts of information that basically Mass DEP has received um, with regards to the incident. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. A lot. A lot of chemicals because um, different methodologies for sampling actually have a whole suite of chemicals in addition to also tentatively identified compounds. So I think the most efficient way is for us to give you that information and you can give us your phone number and we can have a chat over the phone or some kind of um, video teleconference and we can walk you through all that information. Yes, sir. Right on the website. And John Handerhan is going to um, give you that information. Right now. The easiest way for you to find the website is if the website has a kind of long name. Just Google Mass DEP and Clean Harvest. It'll be the first link that comes up on your Google search. And our website has reports that were previously spoken of to tonight, like the IRA completion report that was presented by Tetratech. That report will have the information that I believe you're looking for in it. If you have any questions when you look at that, you can reach out to us and we'll help you find it. It's a mass.gov website, and I can tell you it's easily searchable because I was trying to get that link for you. If you want to come forward with your question, it also has all the air monitoring data. Okay. Suzanne Torres, um, 109 Broad Street in um, Wayman. And I was told that we could come here because Raintree, Wayman, and Quincy are all connected at that point. Um, and uh, the demonstration that you gave was very understandable and clear, which was nice, and your ideas were good. If they're implemented, I would say, great. Um, I would say, if they're not, can we have you back here in three months or something, you know? And, and um, also, um, people were mentioning that if there's a way to get out to the public, if there's a, another fire, God forbid, but if there is, that they can, put it on um, their phones and on a, on a um, you give them an alert not to walk or not to um, go out and walk and, and to put their, uh, shut their windows um, because nobody even knew that it was happening. A lot of people didn't even know. So that's, that's my, those are my points. Th thank you for your comment. So the comment was, uh, about communications, and I know Mayor Kokoros in his remarks commented about MEMA and the geofencing. Mayor, did you want to, the geofencing is able to capture the cell phone data. Mayor, did you want to elaborate on that? Definitely will be 
something that would be used. If we had it, we would, if we knew we had it, we would use it previously, but it's something that would be used to make sure that not just folks uh, that were within my own two or two of this, but realistically, uh, it could be up you know, to five or uh, six miles. Thank you, Mayor. Sir, with your question, your name and address for the record, please. My name is David Oliver, 172 at Jill Road. Uh, East Spring Tree. I'm, I'm just curious as to how the fire department was notified. Was it a, an automatic conditioning device, a pull station, a phone call, a neighbor, smoke signals? <laughs> no, no smoke signals, I can assure you that. Um, it was a private alarm uh, that first came in that we were alerted to. Uh, by our dispatch, as well as multiple phone calls from employees on site at the house. So, so a detective didn't do it, then uh, an actual person did. Correct. Thank, Thank you, sir. You, sir. Uh, I, my name is Brian Keegan. I live across the cove at 43 Anna Road uh, in Wayman. Uh, and my question is sort of a really detailed one because I have to comment to the report itself. Um, you know, because it was a short time frame and actually the writing of the report and the presentation tonight was carefully reviewed and approved by Clean Harvest before the presentation. So, and if, and if I'm wrong, you know, call me up. But, so on page four of the report, it talks about how the Great Fire Department trucks arrived at 10.05, side of the pine water at 10.10. The understanding is that there were five high capacity water, water uh, guns that were pointed at the fire. Uh, in page eight of the report, it talks about how they stopped applying water to AM, not money. So I'm, I guess I'm asking the, the fire chief. You know, if there was five high capacity, five, five flow guns in operation, and each one of those guns is supposed to be, at a minimum, putting out 500 gallons per minute, how much water was actually used? Um, I think you can make the calculations if you know from a firefighting lot when a certain fire company showed up and started using water. You know, if you do five guns times 500 gallons a minute times three hours, times 60 minutes per hour, that comes out to 450,000 gallons. So I'm just, you know, questioning, you know, what is the right number? So, so for the PCAM, the question is relative to the volume of firefighting water used. I asked the fire chief, not an LSP paid for by Clean Knots. What we can go by is the amount of wastewater that was taken away by Clean Harvest. Um, originally, we thought it was around 400,000 gallons. It's very tough to get a, a, a drop dead accurate number on that because we did have um, four streams of water, straight streams of water from two lab trucks and two engines. Um, applying water to that fire. At what intervals they started, I, I don't have an exact time, so to get that exact gallonage is almost impossible. Um, I'm comfortable with the 330,000 gallon number that was has been put out there. Um, I don't think it exceeded much more than that. Um, again, when we arrived on site, the first engine was hooked up to a hydrant. They applied the first stream. Uh, we did stop flowing water around 1.30 in the morning. We had to keep one stream of water on that last trailer on the left for safety purposes. Well, the second part of my question, we'll probably go back to Tom, but it relates to the fact that 330,000 gallons were captured on site on Clean Harvest property that night, but the burn was breached. Separate, two berms are reached that separates the properties, Clean Harvest from, from Sitco. And it's reported that that flow that went over into Sitco proceeded to flow from 1 o'clock, 1.30, until 9 a.m. the next 
next morning. So there's water over in Sitco that was continuously being pumped up into the treatment system and then flowing into the river. Now the Sitco treatment system has no capability to treat the water that came from the house. It only can treat three part petroleum. So my question is how much, again, how much actual water, you know, was used. Some of it was returned back from Sitco to clean harvest, but how much water went to the Sitco system and into the river? So the question for PCAM is the water, um, the firefighting water breaching into the Sitco property. Okay. As far as we know, we only know what Sitco, what information Sitco has provided to us. So we can't verify that information. Um, but according to Sitco, their system pumped an additional 7,500 gallons into the you know, through their through their treatment system. Our our estimate, my, my belief, and you know, no one was, as you know, no one was measuring, no one was sitting there at two o'clock in the morning measuring flow from Clean Harbors to Sitco property. But it, it's my belief that the thirty thousand gallons that we pumped back represented probably more than we lost to the Sitco property. And that was evidenced by the drop in concentrations over three days after the fire. Again, the measure began on the 20th. It was 90% uh, of the concentrations were not good. Do you have a question? Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Mike Wayne. I'm the environmental coordinator for the East Bank Pacific Association. And uh, this is like deja vu to me. Um, I've been doing this for 40, 45 years now. And when we did this, it was clean hobbies at a hazardous waste incinerator proposal. And we had, we had no, no support from the town. Uh, we had uh, the police department and fire department they had no idea what the hell we were walking into. Uh, the health board said, we don't do health, you know? Um, and a lot of the people in here, not a lot, some of the people in here, were the same people. Now we're addressing the same problem. And may it, may it the chorus, what you're doing is you're hitting these one at a time. You've got to hit the whole five or four or five facilities out in the basin and get a solution to all of these facilities. Each one of these facilities will tell you we're not contaminating you. Not, we're, not, we're not the reason your kid is getting cancer. Exactly stated, it's because I'm working on three different projects right now and that the town should be working on. Um, exactly. Uh, anyway, I, I did the MCP and I looked at that, and it turns out the MCP only provides guidance. The DEP provides guidance, right? Is that a fact? And then, and the health department, you said you provide consultation. There's absolutely nobody that actually addresses the issues and does something about it. Um, Pimsha, we could deal with a gas compressor. Pimsha doesn't. Pimsha told us in the right regulations and still makes suggestions. FERC said that they don't touch on safety. Um, Chuck, um, it's time you address all of these issues. Right now you're kicking the can down the road with these people. And as far as uh, all these other things, um, the air monitoring station, you said the air monitoring station wasn't bad. We had talked to the DEP when we replaced the air monitoring station. You don't place them behind the power facility, in between the power facility and the 10 foot wall. That's what it is. And oh, by the way, there's, there's a um, pump, there's a air guidance from the ocean that adversely affected so you don't get good readings from it. We actually do our, um, do our um, research. You people aren't doing your job. 
All you're doing is you're talking about providing consultation and clean habits. Um, uh, we'll talk to them, by the way. And oh, oh, by the way, I have to tell you what I screwed up to and along with my friend and Dave Oliver. We had talked to one of the clean harvest people when they were talking about building a building up there. And they had told us, we're not going to expand. We're just going to build this building to separate administration from the lab. Sounded good to us, and we don't want to be the bad guys. So we said, yeah, great. It turns out they're moving all the trucks to the, um, to the shipyard right now. And, and I, I saw the documentation from Clean Harvest. It, they said we're no longer going to be doing something about trucks on the side. They aren't. They're going to do it next door. And by the way, you say, well, it's only temporary. Um, if it were temporary, they'd have the trailer there. Well, they poured concrete for this uh, gatehouse there. That's, that's permanent. And I think the next thing you're going to see, Chuck, is you're going to see these people coming to town and expanding their um, facility. Um, I, I also went to the um, Securities and Exchange, and the Chris Water, the Chris Water uh, report said that they, they have got a 43% increase in the uh, Braintree facility, which means they're expanding, Chuck. And you think they're not going to use those trucks over there? As a matter of fact, I wouldn't be surprised if they bought that facility. But um, I do apologize. I've got so many facts, and, and the idea is that I can't give them all to you. Uh, but it's about time the town got out their ass, and it's about time the police department, fire department, stop doing the research, not depending on the numbers that they give you because they're not fact. And it's funny, um, each, I got these, I love this. This is a legal uh, notice right here from one of the facilities. And what it is is it's a disclaimer. And it is a full page, page disclaimer. And it was about the uh, investors, so the investors. And so we went through all this stuff about how much you should invest in that song. And after you read the disclaimer, it says, everything we told you, you probably shouldn't put down this fact. And that's what we're up against, Jack. I do the research. Most of the stuff is, in fact, I've told the people at Fracks in the past, I said, you can't believe everything you read. They put a spin on everything. I'd like to modify that right now. You can't believe anything these people say. Is this okay? Yes, please. I'm Phoebe Morad at 22 Walden Road. I have two, I think, pretty simple questions. One, where does the wastewater go? Where is the way? Where did that go? So the question uh, for PCAM is where does the wastewater go? Uh, so all the, all the water from fire went to our back roof to the Louisiana facility, most of it, that has burned to, uh, we just want to treat that there to be discharged. Some of it did go to our Baltimore facility, which is also one of the wastewater treatment types. Thank you. My other question for you, Mayor, I believe, it sounds like we're going from a smart 911 call system to another emergency management system. Is that the case? Like, what is there a timeline? Again, less on Clean Harbor's plate, but more on the town's plate. What, as far as a timeline for, I only think this can be opened again when we know we'll actually be called when there's an emergency. Sorry about the microphone uh, issue. We had another event that's on call, so yeah. um, as far as the system, we are able to use it. You know, as of today, I think we when we had a conversation with them, uh, they gave us the procedures, the process. So. Uh, whether it's our fire or police department, they'll be able to use it. So, I guess what I'm confused about is it sounds like the public needs to know how it's going to be used, not just, so how, it's, what, it's, what's the public education information timeline? Yeah. So I think our meeting was last week, was last week, two, three. so as far as the system itself, it doesn't require you to do anything. It requires whoever's on scene make that call and um, it goes to every cell phone that's in the area. So there is no um, signing up. The only way, yeah, the only way that you wouldn't get the, the um, uh, notification is if you went into your phone 
found where it was to shut it off. I think there's a shut off for Amber Alerts and things like that. So if you haven't shut off, it's not going to work. But um, or if you shut your phone off at night, it's not work. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Yes. I, I would assume. But any idea if there are other languages? Um, that's something we can find out for sure. Thank you. Councilor. Hello, uh, Elizabeth Maglio, uh, Town Councilor from East Branch Street, District 3. Um, I'd like to uh, address one thing from the previous comment. Um, the water that went to Louisiana and Baltimore um, is separate from the water that went right into the Fall River Basin. So as long as we're clear about that, when we say release, or when they say release, they're talking about water with chemicals that, that flowed over to Sitco, and back over to Clean Harbors, and also into the actual basin. And in fact, the contamination from that water was so bad that Clean Harbors actually had to repave the ground. Now, I didn't see anybody in my neighborhood taking soil samples. I didn't see anybody in my neighborhood taking water samples. And I live right there. And a lot of my neighbors who live right there are here tonight, and they haven't seen you either. And you know, the, 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 what, there's so many things that are sticking with me from tonight. First of all, that there's really not a lot of information. This is an update that's not really very updated. Um, is there any data that has been collected that did not come solely from the companies paid by the companies who caused the contamination? Is there any neutral third party that's not paid by Clean Harbors or Sitco, or overseen by DEP, who is the agency who has authorized all of this? That's problematic, and that speaks to issues of trust and the full, robust, comprehensive nature of the, these, these tests that are happening. Further. The air modeling. Is the air modeling sufficient to classify the soil that sunk to the bottom and is in the sediment? Because you mentioned the air modeling and the plume. We know there was soot on the homes across the basin. We know there was smoke. We know there was fire. We know that um, there were four different trucks spraying water, and we know that there were no, there's nobody that's gone deep to actually test that sediment. We also know that we were told by, by DEP at the, actually we were never told by DEP, that there was a diesel spill the day before the fire. So in addition to that firefighter, the chemical uh, water from the firefighting that went into the basin, was also 3,500 gallons of diesel from Sitco four days before. That's why Sitco has a PIP process, and that's why Clean Harbors has a PIP process. This is something that the community residents have initiated. We're the ones that filed a petition. We're the ones that are availing ourselves of the protection afforded to us by state agencies. We're the ones that are planning a meeting on Monday the 12th and Wednesday the 14th. Maybe I have the dates wrong because I'm, um, am I right? Okay, thank you. And those are taking place at Abigail Adams in Wayman. That's where there's going to be real information. Not that this is not real, it's just not that helpful at this point. We thought there would be more answers and to once again be told that there was nothing to worry about, that the numbers didn't spike high enough, is not comforting at all. It's been months and we're still waiting to get the, to get the information that we need. So, final question is, the white precipitate that was floating, it was noticed by Clean Harbors, it was noticed by Sitco, and it was noted by DEP, because it's in the DEP report. There was a white substance floating for three days. Y'all looked at it, y'all noted it, nobody did anything about that either. So where, where do we stand with all of you? That's really the question. How much are you willing to dig to figure out how to clean up what has been decades 
of complete lack of regard for the people that live around that basin by all of the industries that are there. I've said it at council meetings and I'll say it tonight. Clean harbors, you're not the only polluter. And I'm sorry this is all focused on you. However, you're the ones that had the fire. So this is our inroad. DEP, this is really blamed on you because you're allowing this to continue to happen. You're There's little we can do except ask for the truth and then do our own research. So I'd like to hear sediment, what precipitate, the water that flowed into the basin, the diesel that flowed into the basin. Four questions. So 7,000 gallons, 7,500 gallons of firefighting water flew into the basin, correct? Correct. Flowed into the basin. Perhaps. And, and this was released not, not by us. It was released under city was a discharge permit. Because the water from fighting the fire at Clean Harbors pooled over into Sitka. And Sitco's mechanisms, their stormwater system, their oil water separator, works for oil and water. It doesn't work for chemicals. So they released it in. But it was from the fire. The fire that we were told that nothing escaped. So I'm uh, just going to take a step back here. Thank you, Ms. Maglio, for your comments. The council. Council, council Maglio. Um, um, the first thing is, um, and this is just based on many years of working and watching these types of incidents. We have 30, approximately 30 fires across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that take place every year. So the first thing, and I hope that um, the fire chief would concur, safety first. I understand that there's a need for search of information with regards to the accounting of the water, but I also want to express that all those sites are full in a full mode with regards to assessment and remediation, and there are maps that show groundwater monitoring wells that serve to provide a good profile with regards to any water that's released and discharged into the environment. Um, I, read the, I read the report, as many of you all did also. And given that it was a three hour incident, it did not provide for a pathway for the water to actually leach beyond 18 inches into the surface, into the surface. Notwithstanding that, Sitco does have a low water separator and Clean Harbors has a stormwater discharge um, permit that basically guides and serves to permit the presence of a stormwater system. So we will do the full accounting. Um, there's a lot of information, which is why a public involvement plan is really the best place to kind of dig deep. I have been since day one, as you know, Councillor, encouraging the town to seek a technical assistance grant so that you can avail yourself to your own licensed site professional that can peer review and validate the facts. And I'm with you when it comes to facts. We depend on laboratories that are certified to analyze groundwater, soil. These numbers come from reputable companies that actually get certification. So I believe in science. I believe in the information that's forthcoming. And I do believe in the MCP program, which actually has risk-based public health numbers to compare and contrast whether you do have significant risk. That's my world. Okay, so what about the white floating substance that was there for three days? The white floating substance, again, we have 30 or more fires across the Commonwealth each year. It's not unusual to see that. And basically what happens is safety first. We look for safety to ensure that this is not becoming an issue where people's lives are at risk. We basically depend on the booms. We depend on other absorbents to ensure that we can try to protect and shore up the Four River, which is exactly what happened. So what about the sediment that once it went down into the, the, the base of the basin? The sediments, we 
Again, it was a three-hour event. I'm not dismissing the event as a regulator and looking at the event, but this is not a 30-year event where you have continuous contamination emanating from the actual fire, which is why the Clean Harbors facility is currently under a RECRA program, which is a corrective action program that looks at the historic information. I really encourage you to look at those reports. I would be happy to sit down and walk with you and look at those reports. Those reports actually talk about historic contamination associated with sediment, soil, groundwater, surface runoff. A lot of information since the 1980s because it is a, an industrial facility. Right, every, which, just to close it out, and every single thing that has been permitted and allowed by DEP. So, thank you. Thank you. That last question. Um, I just have. I'm sorry. I just have a comment. Um, the gentleman from Queen Harbors said that the um, the contaminated water went out to uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, I've been to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and it doesn't look a whole lot different from East Braintree. And in that area, there's an 85 mile strip between Baton Rouge and Louisiana that has the dubious nickname Cancer Alley, has one of the highest cancer rates in the country. Now they have the DEP, they have federal government, they have local government. So like Mike Land and Council Maglio says, don't depend on, sorry, these people, but it's really up to us to do something about this and to force you people to do your jobs. Thank you. Any of our panel have any closing remarks? will share with the comment of DEP offering the technical assistance grant to the town. That is something that the administration is working to submit. And we appreciate your, your guidance um, so that we can get that forward. And also Representative Cusack talked about funding in the budget to, for uh, resources for the town for a licensed site professional who would be independent to and a client of the town of Braintree. So with that, if we don't have any other closing remarks, we thank you all for joining us. If you've uh, signed in our, our sign-in sheet, we'll be collecting those. If you do have any other questions, we do welcome you to call the mayor's office. Thank you.